we are very happy today to uh, have our uh, new speaker, it's Professor Randvall. So for this will be our uh, new seminar in the Brain Map series, uh, which is uh, co-sponsored by P41 funded center for mesoscale mapping housed in the Martino Center. And uh, Professor Randvall today will present our her talk about magnetoencephalography and her way from the university to clinic and backwards. And about Professor Randvall, uh, Hannah is an expert in applying. Uh, she's both physicist and medical doctor. And uh, Dr. Randvall is uh, an expert in applying functional neuroimaging methods, especially MAG for studying cognitive and sensory processes, both in a uh, healthy and clinical population. And her current research is focused now and uh, applying and developing computational modeling to functional neuroimaging in clinical populations, primarily traumatic brain injury, ischemic stroke, and neurodegenerative disorder. Uh, Dr. Ranville is also a co-PI in a Horizon-funded AI mind project for creating digital tool for dementia risk estimation in people affected with uh, MCI. She uh, serves an associate editor and member of the editorial board of Human Brain Mapping. She's also chairman of board in Finnish Aphasia Foundation and scientific director of Biomac Laboratory, about which I think lots of people here definitely heard or went there. And uh, so in 2021, uh, Dr. Renwell was appointed to the joint professorship of uh, Helsinki University uh, Hospital and Alta University in the field of translational neuroimaging. And we're very happy to have Hanna here. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. One thing that I uh, didn't uh, say, so Dr. Renwell will have a talk when she will say that uh, there is a time for questions. Please be be free to write the questions in their Q&A board or raise your hands, we will unmute you. This is for online audience, which is our biggest audience, but for offline, we will deal with this. Thank you very much. And thank you, Maria, for the kind words. And uh, great to be here online. So in Finland, it's 7 p.m., but it's it's spring and it's it's sunny outside, so also a bit uh, unusual for a Finnish uh, May e evening. But uh, happy to be here, and um, my my talk today will be again mainly concentrating on what uh, I think uh, MEG is now bringing to to brain imaging uh, at the moment, and I think MEG is now bringing it like um, uh, after some a bit more silent period MEG is bringing a lot of new things to to the field uh, i've been working in, in this field for more than 25 years and uh, in our clinical um, uh, surroundings some people have sometimes said that well don't you bring anything new uh, to the field uh, in addition to epilepsy and now i think we can all strongly say that indeed MEG is now bringing new tools to clinical practice. And I will uh, tell you a little bit of our, of our work on that field. And then I also think that MEG is kind of um, helping us to understand uh, quite a lot of the signals we are actually measuring. And in that sense, we are actually going back from the clinic to the university and, and learning of the, the backgrounds of, of what we are doing with our measurements. So that's kind of the the, the outline of my talk. So it's divided in three parts. So I will talk about how I think MEG is an emerging tool for increasing diagnostic sensitivity, especially in mild traumatic brain injury, which we have been focusing and many other groups have been focusing lately. And uh, the second part of the talk will consist of uh, studies uh, showing that we can use MEG to predict disease risk and also treatment effects in different neurodegeneration disorders. And then as the third point, I think MEG can be really helpful in revealing the underlying factors of the measured signals. Uh, one big motivation for all our work has been that we start to be 
at the position that we have a lot of data from our subjects. So we have structural information, we have functional information gathered with MEG, EEG, TMS, and so on. Uh, we very often have behavioral information uh, also from patients and other clinical data. For example, gene information is not that so not so hard to get uh, anymore. So we start to be at the position that we want to bring all this data together. And that means that also AI, machine learning, uh, all kinds of computational uh, things have kind of evolved a lot within our um, measurement and, and analysis practices. And I think that's it, that has been a really important thing in bringing MEG forward lately. So I will start with uh, the use of MEG in increasing diagnostic sensitivity in mild traumatic brain injury. So uh, I like to refer to this uh, um, statement from Lancet Neurology uh, six years ago, um, where there was a really beautiful um, collection of papers of brain, in brain injury or traumatic brain injury in general. And uh, there they stated that it's really a public health challenge of vast, but insufficiently recognized proportions. So the current strategies insufficiently target the needs of individual patients, generally being based on and one size fits all approach. And I think this is still, at least here in Finland, this is the clinical practice. So we are serving all TBI patients in a rather similar manner. Well, mild traumatic brain injury is a huge health challenge and it affects even in Finland, uh, more than thousands of people and in, in uh, worldwide, it's considered to affect at least more than 40 million uh, people. Um, of all traumatic brain injuries, 70 to 90 percent are mild, and this is kind of demonstrated on the rightmost figure. So if you look at 100 patients, uh, the, the orange ones are easy to diagnose. So they are the ones who either die or have so uh, bad injuries that they require hospitalization. So then the diagnosis is fairly easy. But we have a lot of these uh, blue guys uh, so they are the mild ones, and these are often very young ones, and they may have their hit their head while they were having their hobbies or or so on, and they don't necessarily even go to see a healthcare professional at the early stage because they seem to recover really uh, rapidly after after their uh, head trauma. But up to fifteen percent of these. Uh, uh, patients actually suffer from long-term symptoms, very often related to, to cognition, attention, sleep, and so on. And it would be really important to find these ones. So even if those, even though these ones also eventually recover very well, but as they are young and they often have a lot of um, things going on in their life, uh, work-wise and otherwise, so uh, accurate diagnostics and accurate follow-up would be really important. Uh, what um, makes this uh, diagnostic really problematic is that very often the, most, the mildest ones are really hard to, to detect with structural uh, imaging. So very often the CT and MRI scans remain negative. And all these um, accumulates on the delays in acquiring medical attention for these subjects. So we have recently suggested that MEG and also EEG measurements early after the head trauma could provide increased sensitivity to the diagnostics of these patients. So this is basically not a new idea. So slow wave activity as measured by EEG and MEG has been uh, shown already earlier by several groups to exist, especially in, in uh, chronic uh, traumatic brain injury patients, as demonstrated, for example, in this this figure, but it's not really well known that how uh, often do we see this kind of slow wave activity in healthy adults. So does this provide a reasonable biomarker at all uh, in these populations? And also the appearance of these in the mild TBI patients who are the most difficult to diagnose. Uh, this has not been known very well uh, previously. So these were the questions that we started with so we first tackled uh, this question in healthy adults. So we measured 139 uh, young adults 
uh, with resting state MEG, eyes closed, eyes open for three minutes. And we looked at how many of these uh, subjects without any history of, of head trauma uh, show slow wave activity. And indeed, it was really rare. So only two subjects out of 139 showed such activity, which is demonstrated in this figure. So in this figure, you see uh, MEG sensor level data, uh, power spectral data. So frequency at the X uh, axis, power at the Y axis in two subjects in, in their eyes closed and eyes open uh, situation compared to, to the pool of control subjects plus to standard deviation. So we considered that if the subject um, um, has more slow wave activity that, than controls plus two standard deviations, then that could be considered pathological. But out of almost 140 subjects, only two showed such uh, activity. Well, how about uh, mild traumatic brain injury patients then? So we then measured 26 patients. Most of them uh, they were measured within uh, two months after they had hit their head. And in these patients, we found that seven slow showed transient slow wave activity, uh, meaning that it was there uh, in this early measurement. But when we followed these up to six months after the trauma, it had mainly disappeared. Um, in these seven of these patients, uh, three were MRI negative, meaning that the structural information was not enough to give an objective an mark of brain trauma. Well, these uh, analyses were really done like on an expert basis. So our neurologist, uh, also an MEG expert, Hanna Kaltianen, uh, who was working on her PhD thesis at that moment, really looked uh, by eyeballing all the data. And, and uh, we considered all the, at that point that, that this is not the easiest way to, to bring such a measure to clinical practice. Even though MEG would be available more widely, we would still need an expert looking at the data. So what about in going into more uh, uh, automatic analysis? So we have recently been uh, applying uh, different kind of machine learning approaches on the same data sets. So here you can see what happens if we have exactly the same patients, again, the sensor level MEG data and fairly simple linear classifiers um, uh, in use. So we could basically um, increase our classification accuracy from the 30% from the eye volume to 70%, suggesting uh, that this kind of fairly automatic, easy to implement analysis uh, combined with MEG might actually be really useful and, and fairly easy to use uh, also in clinical practice in trying to find those uh, subjects who might uh, benefit from more close uh, follow-up. 70% uh, doesn't maybe sound very good, but we have to remember that these, these subjects were really mild. So most of them, when they came to our MEG measurement, didn't basically have almost any symptoms. So we are talking about really, really mild ones, and still we can find objective uh, marks uh, with MEG in them. Uh, if we are trying to uh, bring something new to the clinical practice, because of course we have to be sure that our results are stable across sites and populations. And here in, in Helsinki, we have the good opportunity to actually have two MEG sites five kilometers from each other. So the other one in the Helsinki University Hospital and the other one in the Aldo University. So we basically measured two cohorts and also they were separated in time, not only in location, but in time by years. And, and uh, we um, were able to show that actually the results are really stable across sites and populations. So in both uh, our cohorts, the machine learning uh, algorithm was able to, to classify uh, 60 to 70% of the, of the patients accurately, while our traditional uh, eyeballing analysis was much, much below. So then comes, of course, the important question that when to clinic. 
So uh, this is um, something that we here in Finland and, and also many other centers in, in Europe and, and uh, US are actively working on. So uh, one important thing for bringing these kind of things to clinic is, of course, the, the, the storage of imagery. And for example, we have been now uh, actively applying this same kind of analysis and measurements to, to EEG data from the same subjects. And I don't have the data to show you yet. Um, it's noisier and it's not as good, but it appears to work uh, fairly well as well. So uh, may maybe we could, uh, we are that way also get these kind of um, measures for a wider audience. So uh, this was the first part of my talk. So I would say that MEG already provides promising generalizable biomarkers for subacute mild traumatic brain injury and classification accuracy improves nicely with computational approaches, even at the sensor level. So if you have uh, questions at this point, uh, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, if our audience has questions. Okay, Abbas has question. You can probably come just here because so, so everybody like Hannah and the audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I just uh, had one quick question. So uh, clinically, if, if you identify or potentially identify uh, patients that, that might be suffering from this mild TBI, uh, given that like your accuracy is right now about 70%, uh, what would happen, like, what, what is the course of, uh, or, or treatment, or course of action that you take with mm -hmm. these? For example, with, will this be a risk if you, for example, misidentify someone as having multi-BI and take that course of action, or, or no? It's just going to probably benefit those potential MBTIs, TBIs much more. Thank you. Yes, this is a very good question also from the point of view, but what if we, we uh, follow too much, because at least uh, here uh, there have been lots of discussion about the insurance things and so on. So, of course, we don't want to make people more sick with, with this kind of thing. So, so it's a, a delicate thing. But basically what we, are, what we have been now kind of uh, promoting here is that uh, the kind of guidance that these subjects who kind of they, they feel that they are not fine. And we can say that, OK, that we can show you that you have, there's an objective change, but we can also say that it's really, really um, uh, likely that you will recover or also at the functional brain level uh, in the follow up. So we can kind of uh, it's kind of reassuring. But then what we can also, in addition to kind of diagnostic sensitivity, which also appears to be quite important to many of the subjects, is that we can, uh, at least we would like to uh, give more neuropsychological uh, support, because we have a traumatic brain injury clinic where we have neuropsychologists, and they kind of give general guidance to all of them, but they could, for example, target uh, their guidance to these uh, patients, especially, and, and kind of have a bit more follow up and so on, because these are usually the, the things that we can do at this point. Thank you. A very, yeah, very good and important question, really. Okay, but I will then go further and uh, to do neurodegeneration, uh, which also is now actively detected with MEG, not only by us, but also from, from by others, several other groups. And I will here has the examples of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, which are the ones that also are closest to, to us. And uh, why Alzheimer's disease has now appeared a really um, kind of um, 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 appealing target for MEG is that uh, there starts to be understanding that many of the most earliest changes in Alzheimer's disease uh, happen uh, years, even tens of years before the clinical symptoms appear, and they most likely happen at the synaptic level, for which MEG and EEG might provide uh, good measures. And uh, there have been a, a hypothesis on and theories suggesting that actually these, whatever happens there at the neural level, kind of um, are the cause and the link to the other changes that we also see at the structural level later on in these, these subjects. So it has been suggested that the disturbance of neural activity 
and in particular, the imbalance of excitation and inhibition would happen really early in the in Alzheimer's disease. And that would kind of result in, in overproduction of amyloid, uh, which would then uh, kind of uh, cause more toxic effects on the neurons. And it would kind of cause a vicious circle, uh, which in the end, uh, not only uh, uh, destroys the, the, the local neural circuits, but also cause network dysfunction at brain network level and uh, accumulate the, the uh, um, amyloid, which then is, is seen in these subjects at the structural imaging and, and so on. And uh, this is not only a hypothesis that MEG EEG could, be provi could provide useful information, but it has already been quite successfully used by, by several groups, uh, um, especially um, Fernando Maestro's groups, a group in, in Madrid has for years been working on using MEG and combining it with artificial intelligence in predicting which of those patients who don't have Alzheimer's disease yet, but suffer from mild cognitive impairment would develop in their cognitive decline. So it's known that subjects who uh, are in this mild cognitive impairment stage, so kind of stage in between clear uh, dementia and, and normal aging, 50% uh, of these develop uh, clinical dementia within uh, five years. So they are clearly, it's a risk group which should be studied. And, and what uh, Fernando Maestro's group has been uh, doing, they have been uh, showing using MEG and especially MEG connectivity measures that they can, uh, when, when combined with machine learning, they can quite nicely predict which of the subject stay in a stable state uh, within the three, uh, five next years, and which of them uh, progress to clinical dementia. And this is demonstrated here on the right side figure. So of course, there's still quite a lot of overlap between the groups, but I think the, the result is already quite appealing. And then um, other groups, uh, for example, in Italy, uh, Italy uh, Vecchio and others have been using EEG functional connectivity, and they have also brought other clinical factors like gene predisposition, especially APOE alleles, which are known to, to significantly increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease into the analysis package. And they have even been able to, to go up to classification accuracies of 0.97. So this kind of, uh, when you look at these figures, it kind of sounds that this is already solved and we can just yeah, bring MEG EEG to the early uh, dementia diagnosis. But we all know that that's of course not the case. So we are not there yet. So when these uh, measures are then taken to, to new populations, to, to new uh, clinical, really clinical practice, then the numbers drop. And so these are not, we are clearly not there yet. And this is now something that we have also now uh, working together with the Italians and, and Spanish groups here in Finland. So we are all uh, working uh, in this huge European Horizon 2020 project called AI Mind, where the idea is that we would, for once, bring together really large unified data set. And so that we could really uh, dig into the important uh, features in MEG EEG data and in the clinical data. And, uh, and again, with the use of, of AI-based tools, try to find the, the connection of the, of the most important features that would be most useful in clinical practice. So uh, we are uh, measuring altogether 1,000 participants uh, in four clinical centers. Uh, so Helsinki is one of them. And, and uh, we are here in Finland and in Madrid, we are collecting both MEG and EEG data. The two other clinical centers are concentrating on EEG data alone. And we are measuring these subjects four times within two years. And we're also collecting lots of other data. So gene markers, uh, blood biomarkers, which are, have been suggested to be quite sensitive as well. And uh, then a different kind of cognitive testing, uh, of kind of the traditional neuropsychological testing, but also digitized uh, kind of new generation cognitive tests. And the idea is that we, first of all, try to find the most predictive features from the MEG EEG data of the network disturbance in these patients and 
as, as the next step, we aim to bring all this data together with the genes, blood biomarkers, cognitive testing in uh, idea of, of trying to find the best combination for dementia risk assessment in these uh, subjects. So if everything works, then this would be the thing what we would like to have in some years. So we could kind of forget the clinical follow-up of months and years, which we now have, because we don't really have good diagnostic tools. And basically we often get the diagnosis when the disease is already quite far and you can basically see it from the patient. So could we could replace it with a compact uh, short examination period, which would start from the symptoms and, and uh, the clinical examination, but would then be followed rapidly with MEG, EEG uh, measures, uh, automated analysis of them, and uh, the needed cognitive testing, blood samples, whatever now will bring, bring the best accuracy for our model. And in the end, we would be able to find those uh, patients of this huge uh, group of, of subjects who would uh, apparently have the biggest risk and who does benefit best mostly from the, the prediction uh, risk prediction assessment. And at the moment, we can only, of course, provide risk factor recommendations in a sense that we don't at the moment have uh, very good, uh, effective and, and, and safe uh, medication available, but we know that they might be already quite uh, close and also for those medications, these kind of studies would be are really important because I think here we can find, we can try to find the best target groups for those medications, especially if we end up with medications who also have considerable side effects. So again, we come to the question, question that went to clinic. Well, actually this is already available, at least in Amsterdam. So the, the memory clinic in Amsterdam has already implemented this kind of a, a platform in a sense that they have MEG measurements uh, for some of their, their memory impairment patients. So that they start the week with the MEG, then they do an automatic um, machine learning analysis and the machine suggests uh, memory disorder diagnosis, and then clinicians go clearly and and um, and carefully through the, the data, and then they have a discussion with the with the subjects. But of course, we all now just know that there is still a long way to go. That this is fully in in clinical practice. And here, as I said, we are kind of bringing MEG and EEG together the whole time because for us who have the background and MEG, and we, we know how, how nice it's in, from the clinical uh, point of view, the easiness, the, the really uh, low noise levels and so on. So for us, it's, it's of course the measure, method, of, method of choice, but we know that it's, it's still not widely available. So we need to think of the other possibilities and, and the usability with EEG. I will then uh, shift to Parkinson's disease because it's a really different kind of neurodegenerative disease, but also really uh, brings a lot of disability to the to the subjects. And this is something that we have also been working now quite a lot during the recent years. So in trying to find different kind of non-invasive biomarkers for PD and especially for for following its treatment effects. So those of you who are not that familiar with Parkinson's disease, so it's an neurological uh, disease uh, and which is caused by a loss of dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia and it results in motor symptoms uh, typically of cratokinesia, rigidity and resting tremor. Uh, there are oral medications uh, for, for Parkinson's disease but uh, mainly uh, all subjects within 10 years of the uh, starting of the disease end up in a situation where they suffer of like fluctuations in their in their motor symptoms and then the, the oral medication is not enough. And for these subjects, deep brain stimulation is, is very often considered and it's, it's considered the most effective treatment at the moment, but it's, it's invasive. The idea is to, to kind of um, make a functional lesion typically to the subtalamic nucleus and so on kind of uh, disturb uh, the malfunctioning motor circuits in the brain, but it, it, is, it is invasive and, and, and we should find biomarkers to, to uh, kind of accurately time these, um, these um, 
treatments uh, or the operations and, and so on. But um, MEG has been used to follow uh, PD patients for, for some time. And it has been uh, shown that PD patients show different kinds of changes in both rhythmic and non-rhythmic cortical activation patterns, which can, can be used as a kind of uh, biomarkers. So uh, we know that the resting brain generates many silent rhythms that are uh, quite nicely accessible to MEG. And very silent of those is the somatomotor uh, beta rhythm, also called Roland rhythm or mu rhythm, which also in healthy subjects is known to be modulated by many perceptual and motor functions, for example, tactile processing and, and different kinds of movements and even seeing a movement. Uh, it's not a tonic uh, rhythm, but it consists of kind of intermittent uh, high amplitude bursts, which predict also behavior and actually also across tasks and species. So not only in, in humans, but also in monkeys and rodents and so on. So it appears to be much more than just a um, idling rhythm. And it has been shown to be uh, altered in neurological disease with motor dysfunction, for example, in stroke and, and also in Parkinson's disease. Uh, this, the rhythmic activity is not the only thing we can uh, measure with, with MEG. So uh, the aperiodic 1 over F signals, signal was for a long time considered kind of a noise, or at least it was difficult to, to discern from, from sensor noise and so on. But, but uh, especially lately, it has gotten a lot of interest and, and in, in many patient populations, and, and it has been shown to kind of uh, reflect most likely passive properties of cortical biomedical cells and dendrites, so kind of the structural properties of the cells. And also these signals have been shown to be altered, both in Parkinson's disease and also in healthy, healthy aging. So then comes kind of the question that can we somehow use these signals to follow up our patients, and indeed we can. So what we have been doing, uh, we have been uh, using um, um, MEG to check what happens uh, for this cortical beta activity in, in PD patients when they are having this DPS stimulation. So when they are kind of treated, compared to uh, a situation when the DPS is off, so when they're kind of uh, in this disease, maximum disease state. So what you see here is uh, we have been looking at this beta uh, bursting with MEG, so we have kind of filtered the MEG sensor level data to a beta uh, uh, frequency range from 14 to, to 30 hertz. And then here you see kind of the amplitude envelope of, of those bursts in healthy subjects, uh, then on, on uh, DPS on patients and DPS off patients. So what you can see that the DPS off, so that kind of the diseased brains, they have much more beta activity in amplitude, but also the boost durations are much longer and they have much more boost burst clusters. But when we then put the DPS on, so we try to start the treating, so it kind of everything goes much more uh, closer to the healthy, healthy uh, status. So uh, I think this is kind of really nice because it, it means that, that this not only facilitates our understanding of the role of, of this kind of beta bursting and the underlying oscillatory network in Parkinson's disease as such, but also suggests that these kind of markers could be used in uh, future as a biomarkers for treatment effects and even for the disease follow-up. So a summary from this part, I uh, conclude that MEG can provide timely and non-invasive biomarkers of both cognitive decline and Parkinson's disease treatment effects. But in all of this, uh, it has become really clear that especially when we go to the, the heterogeneous uh, patient data, big data sets are needed for establishing the most useful markers. And for that, this kind of um, big um, multi-center studies are really crucial. So this was the, the second part of my talk. So are there some urgent questions at this point for, for this? I don't see questions in the online audience. So we probably 
can just proceed. I, I'm sure I, I have questions, but we can. Okay, them. you can. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so my third part of this talk um, consists of of what we what I think we have kind of already learned about the underlying factors of the measured signals based on these studies, and and what we have. Um, what we are about to learn, I think, with these kind of measures. So uh, I go back to this beta activity, but not now to Parkinson patients, but to to healthy subjects, because uh, while we were working on these patients, uh, we started thinking that well, well, what could be okay? But we see differences in the patients. We see deep treatment effects, but what do these signals actually reflect? at the cellular level. Do we have any idea uh, or can we somehow learn from MEG data that what are we actually measuring? And so that would be really helpful in understanding and then also the changes in these measures. And again, the big data comes into question. So uh, we measured 210 healthy adults and, and they happen to be from, from uh, 100 families, so they were siblings. So we were able to a bit more closely look at the uh, possible heritability, heritable factors in their cortical activations. And here we looked at the, the somatomotor so part. And uh, so again, like really easy resting data, uh, the data eyes open and, and we, we looked at different kind of features from the uh, resting state MEG activity. So we looked at the peak, peak beta power, total beta power, but also then these, these uh, changes in time in this beta activity. So the beta burst uh, durations, their amplitudes, and also their frequency. So all this was then put into heritability analysis. And what we found was that first of all, uh, there are very different kind of patterns of, of the cortical activity in different individuals. This is, of course, very familiar to all of us who work with, with individual uh, brain data. So people are individuals also, also in these, these measures. But this uh, figure shows uh, sibling pairs. So red and um, black are sibling pairs. And when there's blue and, and or even green color, it means that there were more than two uh, siblings in that family. So uh, as you can see, so the, this here that runs from the uh, x-axis runs from 14 to 30 hertz. So the, the prominent peak uh, frequency range for beta activity. So you can see that it looks very different in different individuals. Some has like a really peaky appearance, some have really wide appearance, but apparently many of the, the siblings do share similar kind of features in the uh, general appearance of this activity. When we then look at the, the really heritability values, so what we found out is actually the, especially the power of this activity and then this one over F uh, behavior were highly uh, heritable. So there the numbers were even like up to, up to uh, 94%, which is really, really, really high heritability. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these timely um, characteristics, like the duration, uh, they were not, uh, they did not uh, exceed uh, very significant heritability values. So indeed, uh, sensory motor rhythmic and non-rhythmic patterns appear to be partly heritable. And uh, what we kind of started then thinking that can we now learn something from these differences, these heritability patterns? And I think it was really interesting that actually these one over F components, which I just said that they are considered to reflect uh, kind of a cellular level uh, characteristics and mainly maybe kind of fixed anatomy in our brains. So they were really highly heritable while these durations, which might be kind of uh, more like a network property. So me need kind of input from different sources and kind of be a summary measure of that they might be much more kind of individually affected and even like environmentally affected in that sense would this would might explain why they are not as heritable as the fixed amount related but anyway i think this was really um kind of in, important and kind of um intriguing uh, finding but um what then of course comes that can be somehow 
uh, take these uh, results further. So go beyond, beyond the heritability. Can we really go even to the gene level? Because if we could find the genes which underlie these uh, changes, then we could say much more about these signals that we are measuring. Um, we have been collaborating here with geneticists and they were, they were all the same thing that, okay, you had 200 subjects, it's nothing. You need at least 1000 subjects. So, but we didn't give up. We started saying that what if, again, we uh, keep bringing some other tools to the, uh, to the analysis. So when we have this high dimensional brain imaging and genetic data and rather small experimental group sizes. So we evidently have fairly weak statistical power, but could we somehow help the situation with efficient computational approaches? And this is something we have been now doing in, in collaboration with the computer science department here in Aalto University. So uh, we have been looking at the image spectral powers uh, and, and used a kind of a Bayesian um, approach. Uh, it's called Bayesian reduced rank regression. It's an example of latent variable models, which aim to explain high dimensional response with a small set of predictors. Uh, it's a Bayesian inference, uh, which is quite nice because it also provides kind of a nice framework of utilizing meaningful priors. And for example, for these data sets, uh, we had these siblings. So we knew some of them were from the same families though. So they were evidently sharing some genetic background. So, and, and the nice thing is that this kind of model can take into account several different variables. So we could even bring more things into the model. But here we, we had uh, these families. So what we did, we trained the, the algorithm so that it would learn to uh, what is uh, shared between the, the siblings. So the aim was to minimize within family and maximize between family differences. And we used 90% of the data for the training and then tested the results on the uh, remaining 10%. And what comes out, uh, so now we put in uh, spectral, MEG spectra. So what we get out are spectral compositions, which we here call components that maximally differentiate between the phenotypes this uh, time, the families. And here on the on the right side, you see like really, really simple uh, figure of two of the components. So basically what we got what, what they got out were different kind of uh, spatial spectral um, divisions on the MEG channels. And uh, then we had all the, the participants in this multi-dimensional um, space. Uh, which was kind of expanded by these different components. But here for simplicity, we have only two dimensional space. So but each of these dots yeah, represents one subject. Well, first of all, what was interesting is was that this actually this component structure could be linked to gene level. So we were able to show that the certain kind of uh, component structure, for example, the, this left-sided MEG, uh, channel level data, which basically only describes um, power, uh, the overall power. Uh, so these uh, actually nicely linked uh, to um, um, certain gene, uh, SDK1, sidekick cell adhesion molecule one. And uh, this particular gene has been implicated in neural functions, uh, especially in neural connectivity and so on. And it, it's highly expressed in human brain in general. So it just says that we are kind of on the right track. We are finding links to genes with, with our MEG analysis. But these were kind of on the, on, the, on the edge. So I don't want to go into this more here, but what was even like more at least uh, surprising for us was that actually First of all, we could find the siblings very really nicely close to each other in this component space. So similar phenotypes clearly resided close to each other. So if we took uh, only eight seconds of MEG data and uh, 20 uh, different subjects, we were able to find your own sibling at the uh, position number six. Uh, uh, compared to uh, to uh, change level, which would be ten, so so it it worked 
clearly better than chance in, in, in finding the, the sibling. But what was even more interesting that uh, when we were looking at the same individual measured twice, so for example, eyes closed, eyes open, or doing some kind of task, uh, which to a naked eye, when you're looking at the data, looks really, really different, this condition. So, uh, but for the machine, it, they were not that different. So the machine was able to, to find the same individual really nicely from two really different kind of measurements. And, and this was uh, somewhat surprising to us. So you only needed like five seconds of data and, and you were already basically perfectly uh, finding your own uh, data from completely other, other measurement. So different task or different day and so on. And this was something that we kind of then started calling kind of cortical fingerprint. So apparently there's something really individual in the component structure that we can measure like this. And, and now then comes the question that could this be something that could be also clinically useful? And this is something that we have been now uh, trying to apply for clinical data sets as well. We are quite early in these uh, approaches, but uh, first of all, we have been uh, trying to use this on in kind of uh, grouping stroke patients. So just really, really uh, rough analysis of, of uh, MEG power spectra in, in stroke patients uh, it's, it works quite nicely. We can, with this analysis, quite nicely uh, separate the contrast and patients, which, of course, is not really informative. We, we know that they have suffered a stroke, so we don't really have any clinical usability out of that information. But what we are now trying to do, we are trying to uh, check whether we can kind of have subgroups within these, these, um, these uh, divisions. And would these subgroups, for example, um, predict uh, recovery or something like that. So could these kind of measures be used for these kind of uh, clinical applications? Uh, another uh, task or, or data set where we have been using this similar kind of approach is, is uh, EEG from healthy children. Uh, we have uh, luckily been able to, to get uh, a data set from, from our children's hospital which is of, of 800 health children who have been undergone EEG at certain time point from, from um, eight days until 18 years. So we have a huge variety of, of, of different ages there. And all these children have been followed up so that we know that they are healthy um, in, 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 in their cognitive development in the end. Uh, so this kind of uh, fairly simple uh, analysis uh, already can predict uh, the age of the children quite nicely. I think you can see that there's a clear kind of tendency of, of, of uh, older ones and younger ones to group into certain uh, parts of the axis in this figure. And what would this then be useful for? So, so for example, we, we know that all the children are developing in a different way, and these kind of measures might be, might be helpful also in clinical follow-up of, of when they are or cognitive problems and, and so on in trying to kind of find the way in the brain age we are going on. But these are like really uh, going on studies and, and, and I will tell you more when we are have the final results of this. But uh, I'm now in the end of my talk. So, so this third part, uh, I hope you learned that heritable cortical features can be really mapped to even genetic level with a moderate number of participants. So 200 subjects is moderate from in, in, in many other fields of, of science, as you know. And I think we can use these kind of measures to bring information of the underlying signal generation, which is quite informative when we are uh, working non-invasively. Uh, and especially these cortical fingerprints appear really appealing and, and we hope that they would also have some clinical applicability and in that sense also bring more new uh, use for MEG. So thank you uh, for your attendance and, and then I of course want to thank all my collaborators which are a lot and then of course the, the funders of our research without whom we haven't been doing anything. So thank you.